This morning, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Daniel Yun from Temple University, a great friend of mine, but also a, a colleague that I respect um, tremendously uh, because of I've, I've followed his career over time. Um, so just to give you an um, introduction of you know, what Dr. Yun has accomplished. Now, he's currently a professor of urology at Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. Uh, he both finished to complete his undergraduate education from the Penn State University in 1994 and then uh, went to Temple University for his medical education and completed in 2001. Uh, subsequently, completed his urology residency just when robotic surgery was taking off at the uh, mecca of uh, robotic surgery at the time, which is the uh, Henry Ford Hospital uh, and the Valley Creek Institute. And he completed his residency in 2008. Uh, in the middle of that, he did complete a fellowship in minimally invasive and robotic surgery, again, uh, under the, uh, um, the, the mentorship of Dr. Um, uh, Menon. Uh, since then, uh, he uh, was uh, following the, uh, his uh, training, uh, became first appointed as an assistant <coughs> professor of urology at the University of Pennsylvania uh, from 2008 to 2012. And since 2012, he has been a faculty member at Temple University, uh, where now he's currently a professor. There are just too many accolades for me to um, go through on uh, reviewing on Dr. Yoon's uh, career. Uh, he currently holds multiple leadership positions at Temple University, uh, of which he, uh, of which one is that he's chief of robotic and surgical services. He's also won numerous awards. Uh, which includes, again, multiple best surgical videos at the World Congress of Endurology. The last one was in 2017 and 2018. Uh, he has uh, spoken to many institutions at uh, many venues on uh, this two numerous accounts. He has published 119 uh, peer-reviewed publications, and he has trained over 15 fellows. So this morning, we have the honor of, again, having a Dr. Yoon speak to us about strategies of and strategies to enable complex robotic upper tract urinary tract reconstruction. Okay. All right. So again, um, Dan, uh, thank you for coming this morning and look forward to your great talk. Thanks, All right. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk, there's a lot to talk on in the area of non-oncologic and reconstructive surgery uh, using the robot, but um, I'm going to focus in on upper tract today. Um, you know, what... Uh, uh, what <clears throat> Isaac didn't tell you was that, you know, I kind of went through state school programs and uh, I matched for your, I, I applied for urology. I actually um, never, I didn't match for the first time around. Mm. I was heartbroken. I decided that I was going to dig in my heels and this was what I'm going to go after. And it's just, uh, it's funny how things work out, right? You're, I ended up really blessed to be at the right place at the right time and was at the Vatican Institute right when robotic was starting to break out. You know, Ash Tuari was my chief president, and uh, Keith and Madani was like a year in front of me, and just everything just happened so quickly after that. So uh, I feel like, uh, you know, somehow I found myself in this incredible journey, and, um, and so I'm just very grateful. So uh, I grew up in South Korea. This is my older brother on the left, uh, walking me up in the chicken coop. Um, <clears throat> my father was a physician in kind of post-Korean uh, War era. Time in Korea was very poor at the time. And through various life circumstances, he ended up becoming a missionary physician in the West Bank, Palestine. And that's where I started my childhood. <clears throat> uh, we lived in the West Bank near Hebron and near, uh, in Bethlehem for a while. We uh, would commute in a, through the checkpoints every day to go to school in Jerusalem. What an incredible way to grow up. So I feel uh, very, very uh, fortunate that I can have that kind of unique childhood background. It's my picture at the Anglican School in the old city in Jerusalem. And I'm still very thankful to my dad uh, for making those choices and letting, allowing us to grow up this way. <clears throat> so we ultimately ended up in Philadelphia. And I always looked up to my dad and wanted to be a physician in my heart. I uh, met uh, my wife, very fortunately, at Penn State, um, and I spent a year actually before med school just delivering pizzas and washing dishes and just getting ready, you know, to see if this really what, you know, what I wanted to do. And I definitely realized delivering pizzas for a living was a very difficult way to go. So I went off to med school, um, <clears throat> and like I said, I didn't match. Um, I, I did a, surgical, a one year of surgical internship at Pennsylvania Hospital. I reapplied and ended up going to Detroit in 2002. Um, the picture for my training, <clears throat> and I kind of jokingly say, although it's not really true, 
I, I got a residency in robotics, not residency in biology. There was just so much robotics going on at the time. We were doing seven process techniques a day. It was like drinking out of a wall, like a hot fire hydrant. Um, we actually, all we wanted to do was actually not be in those rooms. And I just wanted to go to like a PCNL, <laughs> you know, or see some other, you know, operation because we just did so many of them, right? Um, and so every single chief graduating could do a sub one hour process technique in those days. It was just incredible, right? So, uh, at leaving Detroit with this uh, unbelievable gift that was given to me, and then going off to the University of Pennsylvania for, for my first job, and you know, it couldn't be any. It, could, it was so different, right? Um, and there were both, you know, points of view that I really took heart, right? My old boss was like, everything is going to be done robotically, and Alan said, hold on a second here, let's let's just um, be careful what we're saying, and let's, you know, you have to. Go by an evidence fashion, evidence-based fashion, and carefully, you know, uh, figure out what you can do. And so, uh, you know, one was hitting on the accelerator, and one was hitting on the brakes. And there were, it was a good balance where I learned a lot from both. And over the years, uh, starting in 2008, I, I really started applying the robot carefully to various disease uh, processes. And I stopped filling out this chart a while ago, but there's so many different kind of things you can do um, with the robot. So. Uh, you know, robotic system as it's evolved over the years, as the platform has gotten more capable, I kind of look at it as, a, as like a, a Swiss Army knife for lots of different uses. <coughs> One of the things I was uh, fortunate enough to do, you know, when I was at Penn, and you know, I was always uh, in this mindset of running two rooms like we were in, in Detroit, the difficulty was running back and forth between two rooms was, was, was um, not good for the Patients necessarily in some cases, but also not good for you, not good for training. Um, it's just you're barreling through one case to get to the next, and you're not teaching very much. And so um, we traveled around the country a little bit to look at operating rooms that were out there, and then we thought about you know really what we wanted to do. So we built. Uh, it took a couple one year from the time I signed my contract to design. Uh, we knocked out four operating rooms to build kind of this uh, command room where I would be able to uh, you know keep an eye on one room and allow the residents or fellows to go much further and uh, really uh, maximize teaching capabilities and opportunities and still uh, keep an eye on and the timing. And so we typically will stagger our rooms. I tell all my patients about overlap and surgery, uh, let them know that portions of their operation may be done by a resident or a fellow. Uh, and then we try to integrate our junior residents with bedside with my PAs. So I have two PAs at one room that runs each room. This room is actually straight, but it looks bent because it's on an iPhone. But this is, um, you know, the suites that we've been using. And um, I think this has really transformed in, in, in our house, like how well we've been able to teach and the, the amount of intensive coaching that we can do um, and take them out further. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been, you know, I guess pushing boundaries and, and, and pioneering procedures and redefining how we do things, you know, over these years. And, and I feel like there's a, there's a foundation that you first have to have when you do this type of work, with just really excellent training. You have to be honest with yourself and the patient. So I talk to the patients about, you know, like next week I have a uh, renal vein transpos transposition for Nutcracker. You know, I've seen the videos out there. But I've never done it before, right? I've done a lot of similar stuff. I've shown, you know, graph on cable before cable thrombus. So I I've talked to the patient about this. She knows and she's okay to proceed. But, you know, this is, you know, some sleepless nights. <laughs> You know, some uh, anxiety that comes along with the job when you're doing things that are kind of outside of the box, right? Uh, it, you know, you have to be able to take criticism for what you do. Um, you know, you will have complications along the way, and you will be under fire. And you have to. Uh, you also have an obligation to publish and present. You know, so I've seen uh, non-oncologic robotic surgery just explode right now, and, and um, so almost have 50 percent. Some weeks, it's more than 50 percent of our work is non-cancer type of work. And so going on uh, further into this topic, you know, this is, you know, what upright urinary tract reconstruction used to look like. And uh, uh, this is, <coughs> um, when I look at various parts of the urinary tract, um, you know, for the lower uh, portion, you know, below the iliacs, you know, we have a little bit more leeway because bladder tends to be a big organ. You can mold it, you can pull it, you can bring it to the ureter. Um, but in the mid and in the uh, proximal ureter, you know, you have very limited options, you know, traditional option before you go to like a big gun procedure, right, uh, where you're uh, opening them up or, or potentially opening them up and, 
and, um, and uh, the complication rates certainly uh, are there, or you're going to go to an nephrectomy option. So there's just, you know, when I was in the early days when I was trying to do these type of operations, I was really trying to make magic happen with very little options. And since then, we've been able to develop a lot of other procedures. Um, um, so the um, uh, three kind of uh, big modern concepts, uh, you know, and I say the first one very carefully, access with a robot. You know, nowadays, we're going in on everything, right? We're, we're not really holding back, right? Um, and I think that when I say, say this, you know, I just spoke about this at the Mid-Atlantic, uh, you know, it really has to be done carefully in the right environment with people with the right um, experience because there can be considerable damage that can be done, um, you know, um, accessing a post gunshot x lap, you know, redo and uh, after small bowel obstruction, you know, after radiation, sometimes all of it be done, you know, you know so, uh, uh, and we do this all, probably almost on a weekly basis where we're busy porting and we're doing tremendous slice of adhesion sometimes for several hours before we can get down to the playing field and get to work, right? Um, the other one is near infrared, used in various ways, and we'll talk about this, uh, can be uh, used uh, to help you to find things that are very hard to find in some cases, and to also figure out what has blood supply, what doesn't give you some guidance in the operating room, more than just looking at something with the naked eye and saying, that looks pink or that looks like it's bleeding. Um, and then using, um, you know, uh, reinventing old principles to new revised uh, applications. You know, buckle graft, you know, has been a topic in a lot of these meetings now. A lot of people are excited. It's reproducible, a lot of te technique. Uh, appendix uh, in various interesting ways. Uh, and even trying to reinvent ways that we can do uh, re-implant. I did a side-to-side -side re implant on a re re revision re-implant uh, last week. <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, with the te changing technology, the ch changing capabilities, increased capabilities to do some of this stuff. This is a slide from my AUA uh, course that uh, I give with Raju Thomas and Lee Zhao and Mike Stifelman, but it's just like really looking at what we can do robotically here. And essentially, I, it doesn't have to be robotic. You can do the same options with Lupin as well, right? You have a need to, to understand perfusion, need to specifically identify structures sometimes that are very difficult to find in a frozen field or in you know, a, a ureter that's been transected and retracted and need to uh, identify sometimes precise locations in the ureter. For example, if you're doing a segmental ureter activity, right? So this is a, um, a slide talking about near-infrared fluorescence. The technology's been around for a long time, but there's certainly been a resurgence uh, since uh, uh, the robot uh, platforms have uh, taken all this technology and now there's, you know, uh, various other uh, systems to use endoscopically as well as open. Uh, and so the, the, uh, the traditional way to use ICG is injected intravenously. That's the way the FDA recognized it. And you look for an organ of perfusion, right? And then urology was first introduced to us as a group uh, on the robot to do, um, you know, selective arterial clamping. You know, quickly found out that we didn't really love it this way. So this is other ways to use it. I'll show you a video example. I'm sorry the video is so jumpy. I think it's because it's running off a hard, uh, off a jump drive, but this is a cervical cancer patient, high dose pelvic radiation. You can see, you know, the I IV ICG about, about 30 seconds after we inject it, you can see the ureter demarcating on what's the asteroids, what's not. In it's very simplistic form, this is, you know, one of the go-to uses of ICG in near infrared. And, uh, you know, you can make the quick decision to, to do this, without anesthesia, you do it makes up ICG, take them a minute to do it and they're ready to go, uh, you know. Uh, and then we always just tell them, don't do it until we're ready to time it together, until I'm ready, clean up the field and then we inject. So I think we're gonna have some video jumpy issues throughout um, because it's running off on <clears throat> jump drive. But this is a cystectomy patient. I'm about to do an intracorporeal urinary diversion. That's the left ureter I'm looking at to see a little bit of uh, ischemia on the left side, but look at this right ureter, right? So we've got four to five centimeters of this ureter is going to be non-viable. But if you look at it under color vision, it looks completely normal, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, I've been shocked in some of these cases, you know, and it makes sense, right? I mean, the ureters are coming off the intra, the blood supply for the ureters coming off the internal iliac. You've divided it around that location. You've pulled it up and you're trying to extend the ureter uh, 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 mobility. So you're going to, to really dissect up along that ureter. And so sometimes in some ureters, that blood supply doesn't exist, right? Coming from the mid uh, ureter, upper ureter section. And so you have uh, a, a ureter that's not gonna do well after you sew it in, right? 
Um, <clears throat> this is a patient who um, had double level huge strictures <coughs> and we did a robotic ileal ureter. This is the anastomosis to the renal pelvis. I was nervous because I thought I measured it right and it sure looked like we stretched it a lot to get it from the bladder to the renal pelvis. So I'm gonna check perfusion. So about 30 seconds later, we're seeing, yep, the, renal, the pelvis and the, the anastomosis at the, uh, the ileum is, is good. And you're looking down toward the bladder. You know, the bladder side perfusion is great. So I get peace of mind. I didn't overstretch this thing. We're not gonna have like a suture that's gonna break down. And so some, there's many, many different ways. I mean, I have banks of video that I can show you guys, you know, various interesting ways to use it. Uh, this is, I think, your ureteroenteric stricture video. So I'm showing you just really, for the, just re before I finish sewing this up, I'm just going to inject to make sure I'm not doing anything crazy here. I haven't, uh, you know, uh, over dissected this ureter. It looks like everything blows up bright green. I feel really good about um, completing this anastomosis. And so you can, you know, in, in an intravenous fashion, you can interrogate the tissue multiple times throughout the case because it washes out in about 20, 30 minutes. And so you can ask yourself questions like, for example, like when I do a pyeloplasty, um, you know, I think pyeloplasty can be an incredibly difficult operation, right? Um, because the anatomy is so variable, right? And so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll do a minimal dissection of the renal pelvis and the ureter. I won't over dissect it. I'll actually shoot ICG and I'll look in the really immediate, what I call the arterial phase, right? Because you only get that moment, you know, for a couple seconds where you see where the inflow is coming from. And sometimes we'll, we'll change our operative, you know, Plan because we go, oh, if we transect across the UBJ, we're going to take the major blood supply. And so sometimes we'll do like a mucosectomy, we'll keep the most here, you know, uh, area intact. Uh, sometimes we'll do a YB plasty instead. And so, um, you know, we're using this type of information more and more, feeling comfortable with the technology to do this. Um, so the other topic I'll come up is direct intraluminal injection. This is off-label uh, by the FDA, simply because it's it all recognized as an intravenous. But I think similar to somebody who's got IV contrast, uh, you know, allergy, intraureteral, um, you know, the systemic do dose is a lot less. And so the patient's taking on a lot less of a dose. Uh, we've not had any problems with any of the patients that have had this, but this in certain instances, it makes sense to put it into the ureter. You know, I asked the company if um, we could do this back, like in like around, 2012, and they said, no, you got to mix it with albumin, all this kind of stuff. We just tried to start using it just directly into the ureter, and sure enough, it works, right? And so there's a lot of different situations you can use this in. Uh, we started publishing on it um, because there was some, in the beginning, we used it for everything, and then we realized it's overkill, you don't really need to do it. But in certain cases, it makes a lot of sense to do it, right? And so there's all sorts of, uh, uh, so this is a, a really interesting case. It's a, Woman with a complete triplication anomaly, the ureters follow while you're higher, right? The upper uppermost uh, uh, moiety, which is the lowermost ureter, is obstructed and causing infections and pain, and we're gonna take it out. Well, one very easy way to do it is you got three ureters, right? Push ICG up that one ureter of interest. Once you open up the retroperitoneum, it's like a landing strip, right? It shows you where to go, which ureter to play with, and you leave everything else alone, right? And so here is flick on, Near infrared, right? And this is like cheating, right? And you know, there's all just there's worries like the you know, you know what you need to do here, but you know, you're worried about injuring the other ureter, right? And so things like this, you know, retroparent and fibrosis cases where you got to dig out a ureter, it's right next to the cava, you know, it can be very helpful in certain cases. Right. Um, now this is a um uh, intra-ureteral ICG. This is an 80-year-old guy, uh had a cystectomy uh, by one of the you know, you know. Really famous people who suspect me is had uh, a ureteric structure, uh, been essentially told not to get anything done and just manage. This guy was miserable living with, you know, parks, you know, unable to play tennis anymore. And so he flew into Philly, and uh, we, we, I told him this is probably a two to three hour operation. And sure enough, we this is the way it went. But <clears throat> we do all of our ureteric structures this way now. I think this is a very very good way to fix this problem. You know, I was sending these guys to recon people and to just for many years, and the, I just realized nobody was getting fixed, and so I decided to start working on this. And so, you know, you got to do a fair amount of uh, lysis, you know, do neobladders and and uh, conduits. Uh, you know, you got to take all the adhesions down. You got to figure out where everything is. It takes a while for you to kind of get clarity. And I always get residents like, "You think that's the ureter?" And I go, "Everyone just 
stop saying you think this is like let's get the anatomy broken down let's open everything up and it'll become very clear to us where everything is at some point and so usually you know you know one hour two hours into the dissection you start to really open up where everything is you get clarity on where it is and so you know here you know if one ureter is obstructed one's not um, you know you, you certainly don't want to. so here we found uh, one ureter we flicked on icg you know, this ureter was cold, so we knew that wasn't the ureter of interest. We had injected an ICG down the PCN of the, of the ureter that was obstructed. Here you can see, I'm sorry about the jumpy video, it def definitely burns beaks into the conduit base right there. You can see it, and maybe an overzealous IR person trying to balloon this, um, you know, over the many times we've been to IR, and maybe uh, at some point it became a complete, completely distracted ureter. So here, you know, the, all the hard work's done at this point, right? You know, these recon cases, the part that everyone um, looks at on these videos is the part that's the easiest, right? The hardest part is the fighting through the swamp land, you know, trying to get to the playing field. And when you, once you land your feet on the playing field, you know, everything else is kind of easier after that, right? Usually. <laughs> um, right. And so uh, this is a case, uh, interesting, this guy, uh, low grade ureteral tumor <coughs> had been endoscopically managed, it recurred three times. So, I went in, so this is my chief resident's got a uh, ureter scope. We're using ICG without it, I'm sorry, we're using uh, near infrared without ICG, right? We're, and so what I'm doing is I'm poking my needle into the ureter under visualization to make sure I'm just above and just below uh, the, the ureteral tumor. And so we're taking this out. I thought we were going to be able to do a UU. Look at this, it looks like a centimeter, a centimeter and a half. Sure, no problem, right? Well, not always, right? So we, we try to put this together. I was, pulling and I felt like there was way too much tension on there. So we went to uh, plan B, which was a appendiceal interposition, right? And so here we're taking the appendix, um, I'm shooting uh, ICG in the air infrared to look for uh, appendiceal blood supply, making sure I don't mess with that, right? And so we're amputating, you typically need to do a nice cecopexy to stabilize the rest of the, uh, uh, the uh, cecum in the blood supply so that it's nearby and not on stretch, right? And so I'm, I'm like opening this up and I'm like, where the heck is a woman? And what I realize is this is one of the appendices that is obstructed, right? So what do I do? So I go to plan C, right? Which is now, let's do a back wall, uh, augmented uh, ureter ureterostomy. So just put the back wall together under some tension, right? And I'm just gonna open up this appendix and do an onlay, right? So we went from plan A to plan B to plan C. Which, um, you know, it's been super helpful to have my partner, Mike Mitro. He's a properly trained reconstructive surgeon, he's a GRS guy who kind of whispers in my ear and, you know, can give me pointers. And it's, I'll tell you, it's just been um, so different than having a recon partner who's interested in the stuff uh, that, that comes in and out of my rooms. He operates next door to me. So on Thursdays, we do crazy things together. Um, and I always look to Mike for valuable insight. Um, and so um, in this case, you know, it's nice to be able to have multiple options at, you know, on the table so that sometimes when things don't go as planned, um, you have other options to go to. And so uh, here we check my ICG and all this and um, it ends up uh, that we finally uh, have a nice solution for this guy and he's done very well since. Right? Um, <clears throat> so to uh, summarize, you know, the three different ways we use near infrared, there's an unlabeled intravenous, there's an off-label Intraluminal, I mean, you can put this into the bowel, you can put this into neobladders, you can put this into, you know, conduits, there's a lot of different ways, and it's just understanding how this technology works, I think, is helpful because it just puts ideas into your mind as you're thinking through troubleshooting how to do a case. You know, my caution with intraluminal, you know, is that, you know, once you spill it, it smears everywhere, right? And so, um, you know, I don't go to an intraurethral very rarely these days, you know, um, the, the type of cases is where the anatomy is like impossible to find, right? That's where it'll help. Most of the time I'm using, you know, option number one, intravenous. But there are some times when intraurethral can be incredibly helpful because intravenous will light up everything that has perfusion. Intraurethral is that movement only, okay? Um, and so, uh, and then the last one is, you know, just using light from the scope can sometimes be a clever way to use it. Uh, I know my uh, colleagues, uh, you know, Stifelman and, and Zhao, like to use the ureteroscope version a lot more than I do. <clears throat> so I put this picture up here. One is because I 
I like to um, tell people to be very cautious if you're applying dual polarity flap on somebody with high dose radiation, right? And this is the picture of, uh, I still love her name, it breaks my heart every time I look at this picture. We, we <coughs> she's post radiation, um, she had a failed reimplant. Um, uh, I actually was involved with that failed reimplant, and then um, she came back to me. And we did uh, this, and this was in the early days when I was trying to figure out how to use ICG. And I shot this, I shot, I snapshotted this, um, and uh, I didn't know what to do. Right? I'm already carved out the bar, right? And uh, and so what are you looking at? You're looking at a cold flap. Well, I didn't know what to do, so I shrugged and I finished it, right? And like five days later, six days later, she came back and the whole thing had broken down. And it was like two year mess of like building her up nutritionally just to get her to the point where I could send her to my partner to get this aspect. Right. So, you know, the, uh, my lesson here is I've learned over, uh, over the years to trust the ICG signal and to make smarter decisions based on it. Right. And so uh, going on to uh, 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 buckle grass, you know, uh, Dr. Dade in South Africa really, you know, is credited for the first person. Uh, he's a reconstructive surgeon that, that took the uh, buckle graft and the ureter and put them together. And it's like almost like nobody, you know, there's a few other people that did some minor work in this area, but it really kind of was forgotten, right? And, um, and it was Lee Zhao that came uh, firstly out of Alan Laurie's training program and had all these um, crazy ideas. And Lee, uh, as I found, has become one of the most brilliant urologists that, that I've ever come across. Uh, and he is a bit crazy, right? And he was like, yeah, we should do this robotically. So they started, and I remember going to uh, the, WCE in Taipei, and I was, uh, it was so hot, so humid, I was so annoyed and walking through, and I remember walking by um, Stipe's poster, and I looked at this, and I looked at this, and I looked at this, and I said, oh my God, this is gonna change everything if this is real. So I found Stipe, and I was like, you know, literally, is this BS? Like, is this for real? He's like, Dan, no, this we've done for, these guys have all done well, I think this is real. So I flew home, and I, I had a literal reconstructive case the next week, and I did one, and I was like stunned. I was like, this is easy to reproduce, you know, this guy works out. And so I called him back, and I said, we're going to be friends for a long time, you know, because this is like an incredible option. And so since then, we've all merged our series together, and we have or just at about 100 buckle graphs. We've done about 50 of them at Temple. Um, and so um, since then, we've done a lot of work together, you know, just at our own institution as well as multi-institutionally, and won numerous rewards for this. And we really, I really do believe, like, we've moved the ball forward um, in the world of urology because we've been able to fill in the middle, right, the people that, that um, we're trying to avoid giving huge outbreaks. So, you know, um, I used to do ileal ureters, you know, from time to time. I can't even remember the last time I did one. It's been years, right, because we've been able to have other solutions. And so my, my two main uh, points with this is uh, presence of lumen dictates whether you're going to do an onlay, which is an incision, an onlay patch, versus whether you have to cut out the segment because it's obliterated, put a back wall to do, a, do an augmented onlay, right? And so, um, you know, uh, we measure the, the graft fit, don't oversize it. So at this point, this operation has become almost routine at our institution. You know, it's a three hour, generally a three hour, two and a half, three hour procedure to get down there to do this work. And it's, uh, it's almost like, you know, like a, like a glorified pyroblast at this point. And it's, it's, it's kind of neat how that, you know, where I was, I was so fearful in the beginning of this operation because it's so different for, for me. And I wasn't trained to do this kind of stuff. And then as we, the years have gone by, as we've done more, the comfort level that we've, we've had with this. And so we've been able to put, um, 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 some of our data, and, and you know, instead of uh, just publishing now, we can do it. And these are results. You know, there's some more interesting ideas that are coming out of this. And so, the, the, you know, for urethroplasty, I've always watched my partner. You know, oh yeah, take the catheter out, let that uh, stricture mature, right, before you go in and do your urethroplasty. But if you look at ureters, we don't know how to do this stuff because we're just we're in the infancy, right? And so, the concept of urethral rest, just like urethral rest, is now emerging to us. And we've seen a difference in success rates. And so it's from 77 to 90% success rate. When we look at uh, patients, we've rested their ureter. So now I routinely will uh, either pull the stents out if the patient can tolerate and we're not going to get septic or, or have agonizing pain, or we'll park them and remove the stent. We actually have this whole thing with uh, ORIR where we'll actually leave a ureter catheter in, send it down to interventional radi radiology with the ureter catheter in so they can do a one stick perk, and then they pull the ureter catheter out. So we've kind of 
protocolize this because we do this so often now. But we, I try to do this routinely for everybody to give them a three to four week period of uh, neutral rest. Um, <coughs> Eric Cho published this, and you know when we look at, at, uh, at uh, the uh, the stricture length uh, uh, when we're um, doing preliminary studies, uh, you know, we'll realize that the actual graph length is usually about. 50% longer than what we estimated visually to be. And that makes sense, right? You typically will cut a little bit more to get, make sure you're into the open part of the order. So the, uh, the actual graph is a little bit longer than what we estimate the strict length to be. Um, you know, we've looked at, um, um, <clears throat> so this is, uh, you know, when we're talking about obliterated versus not obliterated. Certainly the obliterated cases, so if you're trying to plan your day, and I'm thinking if this is a non-obliterated, you know, three hours, uh, maybe buckle graph, but, if it's obliterated, there's more work to do. Sometimes I have to do a, a, a downward nephropexy to close a six centimeter, eight centimeter gap to a four centimeter gap to do a buckle. You know, there's more work to do. So we see more complications, uh, uh, you know, more uh, operative time uh, uh, in cases that are, so you, you do need to reserve yourself a little more time in the operating when you're, when you're planning of your day if you're gonna do an obliterated case. Right. And so looking at, um, you know, this needs, this again needs to be re-updated, but this was uh, two years ago. Uh, we just caught up with our data um, to uh, uh, 96 patients uh, the other day. <coughs> I'm trying to put it in for the AUA, but um, you can see our success rate uh, for uh, clinical and radiologic um, at that time point was 94% for our radio. Right? Um, and uh, we looked at even longer uh, like strictures. <coughs> Um, for uh, so, <clears throat> I mean, we compared um, some cases that were just UUs and uh, your calicostomy as well as buccal graft. Certainly, we found uh, great success in the buccal graft. Um, uh, uh, this is overall looking at long, long strictures, uh, but uh, patients who did not go uh, under a buccal graft and went under UU had higher failure rates. All right, so this is one of my early cases. This guy got hit by a truck, um, basically ruptured uh, his mid ureter, um, had an ex lap splenectomy at an outside hospital, um, and uh, had uh, transected ureters that I had to find. The only way I could, if you look at this ureter, I mean, it is fused into there. I can't see it. But we put ICG in. It was the only way that we could, you know, we're looking for that slight glimmer of green so that we can hunt for the ureter. And we dug out these ureters from the retroperitoneum. Um, that's just step one. Now, in this guy, case, this particular patient said, if you can't put it together, take the kidney out, right? And, um, and so here, uh, what I'm doing is I'm actually going straight for a buckle. And, um, um, and so you're, you'll notice, and I don't normally do this, I actually spatulate anteriorly on both ends, right? Why? These ureters are super retracted back. I've got, well, there's no way I'm going to put these cut ends together. And so I realized what I'm going to have to do is a very aggressive downward nephropexy to try to close this gap. If I can do this, then it's going to go. If it's not, it's going to be an infractory, right? And so we've anteriorly spatulated. Um, I rarely do that first. And here we're doing a complete you know, downward nephropexy. It takes a good, it's a 45-hour commitment to do a full um, downward nephropexy to get the thing completely freed up. Uh, here we're burning bridges. We're taking the perp tube out. And, um, you know, Alan Morey's published on, you know, downward nephropexy gives you about four to five centimeters of mobility. It sure does, right? And so here, we're, um, you know, three points of fixation. I use a sliding clip technique um, to, to pin it down. That way you're not trying to tie knots under tension. And here is a, a measurement off the lower edge of the liver. We've got about five centimeter mobility of this thing. So now i got one shot, a moment of truth. Will this ureter come together or not? And so we try, and now with this, the Jonathan maneuver, we're able to finally put the back wall together. And so this is a go, right? And so this is now an, uh, an augmented off, right? And so, um, you know, I know this is one of my old videos because the stitch is blue. That means I'm using PDS. I don't use PDS anymore. I use 5 0 monochrome now, just because there's less memory. Um, and you can tell, you know, the, the buckle graphs also a little ugly. Our, our, God bless them, our ENT partners were, were giving us these graphs in the beginning because uh, Mike Mitra had not joined our institution. And so, um, you know, since then, Mike has done all my graphs for me. Uh, they're a little prettier, <laughs> and they're a lot faster, you know, when you have uh, non ent guys in your graph for you. And so it takes typically, Mike, about 20 minutes to go into the mouth. We typically don't even need a doc. 
and he's just a wizard. He just goes in there, gives us uh, uh, really beautiful graphs um, that are tailored in size. They already pre put a pre stitch in. We, we cut a finger of a glove off, and we put the graft into there with the stitch, and they hand us the glove intra-abdominally, and we pull it out. And we do that to kind of protect the graft from getting beat up uh, through the transfer process. And after we're done, um, I've done all of them with momentum. So we wrap over the momentum, very careful and thoughtful about how you fix your momentum into uh, the retroperitoneum to keep you know, the inhibition and osculation process from, uh, from, uh, to occur. And there's a few other, how much time do I have? Have I gone over? No, no, we're coming up. Okay, good. <clears throat> so, um, there's, so there's a lot of other, you know, um, uh, uh, cool things we've done, um, new concepts. And so this concept of non-transecting side to side um, is a way to leave the ureter intact and bring the bladder to the ureter. So obviously this has to be a defect in the ureter that is uh, low enough where you can bring the bladder to it. And instead of transecting across the ureter, right, um, and why would we even do this? You know, so the things that we've realized, things that I've realized over time using a lot of ICG and ureters, is that uh, there's a tremendous amount of blood supply that goes up and down the ureter on the axial blood supply, right? There's typically like two arteries that are running up and down the ureter, right? That we can see on ICG. And that especially for the radiated patient, you know, what I always fear is that you cut that ureter at that location, and then you've taken a major blood supply going down to up. Right off the internal iliacs, right, and um, and then you're going to take a stricture and extend it, right. That's why I was worried about. And I've seen it a few times, <clears throat> and so uh, we started doing these side to side reimplants on a case, especially like I've done it in non radiated patients. That works fine too. Um, I just did one, you know, on a guy that uh, had a crazy revision reimplant that we had to do after a failed sausage uh, in Bawari. We did a nice side to side. Uh, last week, but it's just a, a really, I think, a good idea in radiated patients because even though that you're just been burnt up by the radiation effect, you can still see blood supply coming up, right? There's still intact blood supply in some cases. So, uh, so we started doing this, and this is a, a case, a 72-year-old patient, rectal cancer, high dose of pelvic radiation, chemotherapy, APR, diet, still has a colostomy. We're working around the colostomy to do this case. So he developed an eight centimeter distal, I guess this video is not right. Um, eight centimeter, uh, you know, stricture. It's a complete ureteral obliteration. Um, we placed that PCN tube, and you can see, you know, the anatomy there. Um, and so on this guy, um, you know, we, we're going to show how we do a, and and you can really see the anatomy here. So I'm done, just seeing out the ureter. You can see. I'm sorry for the jumpy video. You can see that. You see that axial blood supply. You can see blood supply coming off the internal iliacs, right, from posteriorly. We want to leave all that alone, right? We're going to identify where the ureter is, is transitioning from normal, healthier you know, tissue where the ureter is open. We can definitely see where it tapers down. It gets cold, right, off the ICG signal, right? And so what we're going to do, and luckily this guy had preserved bladder you know, capacity, right? So that's got to be another component of this. And so we're basically mobilizing the bladder much like we would for a soas hitch and uh, we're uh, bringing in as long as it, it overlays on top of each other we'll shoot icg make sure everything has good blood supply and then we'll do a side slit on the ureter above the area of the transition point and then open up the bladder open it up and then we'll we'll do a reimplant display a side to side reimplant therefore what you're doing is preserving your uh natural ureter orifice and access for the wire right in cases where you know you might need to get up in there uh, but you also have a secondary opening as well in the new reimplant site, right? So that's the idea of a side-to-side reimplant that you're talking about in the meeting. This is what we're talking about, right? This is the rationale for why. Um, and, and so um, I think in, in certain instances, we just do a, a normal reimplant. But whenever, um, you know, in some cases, it makes a lot of sense to do it this way as well. But it's another option on the table. Um, <clears throat> this is a uh, similar kind of concept in that in this case um, we were using an appendix as a true bypass. So instead of using it as a tender position, 
and cutting the ureter and laying it in its place, uh, we're making an alteration from that and using it as a separate bypass. So in the same idea, we're trying to preserve the supply, the blood supply to the ureter. We're not going to transect across it, right? We're going to do a minimal dissection on it. We're going to find the area above the transition point, make a side slip, right? Now you got to bring the cecum over, you got to stabilize the cecum in this position, and you're going to basically roll the appendix out, right? And you're going to put the tip to the bladder, at the dome of the bladder. And so the preconditions for this is when it's got to be right side. The only time I've used an appendix uh, on the left side was on a, um, on a revision conduit where I had like a five centimeter left ear that was crossing under the, the, the colon. That part had died and I was able to swing over the appendix. <clears throat> so, but the, any kind of appendix procedure is typically a right sided case. You're dealing with radiated tissue, you got a high distal stricture, and you've got a small capacity bladder, right? Classic picture, right? 150 cc bladder, right? You're not going to be able to bring this bladder up, right, uh, to any appreciable distance. Right, the patient already has poor water uh, capacity. So on those other guys, I'm really afraid to do some kind of aggressive mobilization and then put a tension sewage and run a worry off of that. That's just you're just asking for it to break down. And so in certain cases, you know, where it fills these pre-existing conditions, we're able to offer them um, an appendiceal bypass. And so this made the on the February journal uh, cover of journal endo. Um, and so uh, I'll end. Um, this is my, my last, this is probably the worst case I've ever done. I got a call at 5.30 in the morning by a urologist at Abington, which is our community hospital. And this is a BMI 61 lady that has a having hysteroscopy. And I guess the GYN didn't realize it perfed uh, the, the uterus wall and pulled out 18 centimeters of ureter, right? There's no renal pelvis here. So I thought I was gonna do an ileal ureter on this case. And sure enough, there's no renal pelvis. This whole thing's been plucked, right? And so there's nothing to sew to. So I look around, I'm like, shoot, I don't know what to do here. I find, ta -da, the world's large, longest appendix ever. But it's still not long enough, right? It's only 12, right? 11, 12 centimeters. And so what do I have to do? So I'm gonna do something crazy here. And I'm still not sure what I'm gonna do. So I do, um, I'm, I'm planning to do a downward nephropexy, it'll buy me about four or five centimeters. I'm gonna do a lower pole calicostomy to the appendix cap. So I take a little bit of a generous cap on the cecum side, so I have something to sew to. And so here we're cutting off the lower, so I took blood supply, uh, I, I clamped it. Here we're doing, a, I'm opening up the calyx and everting it out so that we can, <laughs> you should see me trying to dictate this. This is, uh, you know, I'm making up words at this point, an appendiceal calicostomy. You know, so here, so we're doing a, a we're, I saw, sorry for this jumpy video, but here we're doing the downward effort, we're pinning this, this uh, kidney down, we're gonna take the appendix, uh, to the calyceal system here. So here we're burning bridges, now we're taking the appendix. See, I took, I took a little bit of a generous cap to the, to the uh, lower pole calyx. Here we're mobilizing the bladder. And I'm worried, this is a long case, she's very big. I'm worried about pressure necrosis and disposition injury. And so I'm trying to move this along, but there's, there's a lot of stuff we have to do here, right? And so here I, I did a, somos, a true somos hitch. It's very difficult, kind of in a semi flank position, to do a full uh, the bladder mobilization. I was able to do it. I pulled it up. So we pulled the bladder up maybe five, six inches. You pull the kidney down five, six inches. Now you got your, you know, your clearance to do uh, this, uh, you know, lay this appendix in there. And so we're able to suture it up from above, suture from below, and um, you know, I don't know. By God's grace, this thing finally came together, and. Um, and she has, you know, an appendix that truly replaced her entire ureter, right? Uh, let's see, yeah, kind of the aftermath. I'm sorry, this video is very, very jumpy. So finally able to put this whole thing together. Luckily, we woke her up. She did really well, right? She didn't have, you know, any positioning related issues. This is the way we typically run stents up from uh, any kind of reimplant. Um, uh, we'll just push the catheter all the way up. We don't need to use a counsel or anything. We'll just bend the tip of the foley, throw a wire through, and then throw a stent up from below. This is the most reliable way to place a stent from below. And so here we're sewing it up. Um, that's our appendix in place with the stent in. <clears throat> 
here I'm just doing a little bit of like a, a soda stitch with a bladder fat flap just to give it a little protection here. And you can see what our retrograde look like uh, six weeks post op. Uh, a renal scan that we, we typically run a renal scan in six weeks after uh, step removal. T1 half less than five minutes. She, we, you know, she was diabetic. You know, we, you know, she, we really tried to save this kidney at all costs. And, and it worked out well for her. She has stable renal function. We, I see her once a year. She gives me a big hug. It's awesome. All right, so I'll show you something crazy. Um, so this is a, um, a uh, back when I was at Penn with the neurosurgeons, I was co-docking the robot um, with the CR. And we were doing anterior inner, inner Inner body lumbar fusions at L4, L5, and L5, and S5, right? And um, uh, this was like when I did L5, S1 with them, it was uh, easy. It's like getting the same prom promontory, you know, and then we'd de dock the robot laparoscopically, we'd drill down into the inner space and put these cages in and put bone morphogenic protein and allow the, the and, and in the beginning, I was so skeptical about this, and then I saw um, how well patients did. And then, you know, they come to me a few weeks later and go, can we do an L4, L5? It's completely different. You got to completely mobilize the cava, completely mobilize the aorta. You can see what I'm doing here. I'm putting slings under the aorta at the bifurcation so that my beta side assistant can pull on these strings and uh, we can split, you know, part the waters in the middle so that we can drill an L4, L5. This is very dangerous, right? Um, and, uh, you know, and so this is what, what the procedure looks like. We're now laparoscopically drilling down onto the spine. These neurosurgeons don't know how to do anything laparoscopic. So I'm essentially doing the whole thing for them. Their hand is just touching the equipment and I'm just turning it for them. And so we're doing all this. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I was very proud of myself back then. You know, I was like, you know, young buck surgeon trying to make a name. And uh, we did about 16 of these cases. We did, you know, well, thank God we didn't injure anybody. Um, but then nobody else could do this afterwards. Like all these, uh, the, the, the general surgeons looked at this, and they were like, oh, I'm going to do this after you leave because I was going to Temple. And, and really, this, this became relatively irreproducible because the, the, the difficulty of this operation um, was, was so much. And so I learned some things about this because I spent a lot of time developing this kind of work with them. And that, um, you know, these, these procedures that you're developing have to be reproducible, it has to be translatable to you know, if you're if you're able to do something so extraordinarily difficult, right, that not a lot of people can do, it's not really a contribution, right? And so I, I, the lesson I learned from this is like, you know, focusing on things like buckle graft, those kind of things. The reason why I have so much um, excitement over that is because this is reproducible. This can be done. I've had so many urologists from across the country, an academic and private practice come to me and say, I've been able to do this and it's been a great, you know. And so, um, you know, technology and skills can provide good solutions. You know, so I, I certainly am interested in pushing the envelope and see how we can think outside the box. But it, these things have to be teachable, reproducible, and uh, and uh, and that way the common good is is, is delivered to everybody. Um, so I say, be inspired, be humble, be passionate, change your world. It's from a guy who didn't match for urology first time around. So this is uh, I do a one year advanced clinical fellowship, uh, advanced robotics as a CEO, who was one of my residents that took the fellowship on and traveled everywhere. This is our first buckle graft in, um, in China, uh, in Zhengzhou, the world's largest hospital, 10,000 patients, 10,000 beds hospital, can you imagine? 10,000 bed hospital. And uh, it was so funny because they do you know, all their grafts, lingual grafts, right? The Beijing guys threw this patient in. This is a patient that with multiple failure, redo operations. And so it was a six hour procedure. It was worked until like midnight. And um, they were so interested in Zeho doing a focal graph because they'd never seen one before. So it was like paparazzi taking pictures. And it's just really fun to watch one of my residents become a fellow. And he's now at Northwestern, but uh, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's really my honor. I can't believe I'm here. Thank you, Isaac, for the kind uh, invitation to come here and speak to you guys. Um, and uh, yeah, um, any questions? Have any questions? Yeah. When you're when you're doing you know these very complex reconstructions on patients who have had you know prior X labs and you're doing these robotic, where are you actually getting your access? <laughs> it's always um, a point of debate. Um, so I uh, it depends on the case. It looks it depends on you know we look at the I have to kind of do some amount of reading the abdomen to see what I'm looking at. Um, you know. 
I won't, you know, obviously we'll move away from the incision site and come in. A lot of times I'll try to embarrass in um, from a different site and then I'll look and see where I want to bring in the camera. We typically will put in a Visi Port 5 or a Robotic 8, um, you know, with the camera. A Visi 0 to 5 we'll find ourselves in. Now, many of these cases, you've got like cobwebs everywhere, right? Everything yeah. stuck to everything. And, um, and there's a lot of these, I like to use a, you know, a technique that I've just been working on my own, just using a five scope and doing a scope lysis and breaking up, you know, what looks like it's safe. And, and then with the goal of getting, you know, um, two more robotic ports in. If I can get two robotic ports, especially on an XI system, yeah. it has so much range of motion that when we, when we see the second robotic uh, port go in, we know it's a go, right? And so the, um, you know, the lice adhesions on the robot is just much more rapid, much more precise. You know, uh, sure, we get serosal, uh, you know, separations once in a while, we just send them go. But um, I'd say that like, you know, maybe once or twice a year, we get a bowel injury, um, you know, but with the amount of volume of these type of cases that we're doing, I think it's pretty good, yeah. you know? Um, and these patients, otherwise, nobody's gonna touch them. No one's gonna touch them. So uh, we feel like, you know, the mission for us is to try to be able to give people who are given no options and told they cannot be fixed. A lot of these are young people. They're living out their lives with stents and perks and living in pain. You know, one of the guys uh, become a friend of mine, you know, literally was watching his kids grow up. He couldn't play with you. He couldn't tie shoelaces, you know, and I'd gone to a lot of big centers flown around and then we fixed them. And now like, you know, I see him probably once or twice a year. He's like a new guy. He's like running his business and playing with his kids and wrestling with them. And it's like, ch it's changing these lives for people that really didn't have any other option that makes this type of work so gratifying. You know, you think cancer patients are grateful? These guys are really, really grateful. Right? You said for the, uh, like, the size of the fit. Um, so like for like augmented on or something like that, how does that impact your outcomes if it's excessive. Yeah, I always say like an Armani suit, all right? Make it size, you know, size to fit. What <clears throat> when I realized in the beginning, you know, I, you know, I didn't know how these were gonna go. In the beginning, I was nervous. I made them a little larger, 30% larger. What we found is that um, they balloon out, right? Um, they balloon out. And so I think, you know, when you, if you tightly put momentum, you know, you know, over that area, it probably will help give it some support. But um, I got one patient that, that once a year, twice a year will pass like a crescent stone. <laughs> I know where that's coming from. There's some stasis inside that, that pocket uh, you know, aneurysmal area. And uh, so now I, I size them all to fit. Like, you know, I don't worry about it shrinking. Yeah. Uh, you said that you give patients renal resting before you uh, <clears throat> procedure. Yeah. How much time do you know that you notice before the young? The outcome is better with breast that much. Well, that's so that's we're going to look at that. So, Stifey, uh, I think, does like a week or two, right? Well, not, not very long, so. right? Uh, yeah. And the, the last time he did a, a, a live case on moderate, mm -hmm. I mean, everyone jumped out of his turn on it. But I, I, I was thinking to myself, like, do we really know? Like, you know, like, so Lee Zhao and I like to do the three to four weeks, but we don't really know. So, what we wanted to start doing with the course database is start looking and seeing is there a difference? Between you know, like a ten day versus a thirty day, you know, period of loss. Because I, I don't think we really know. Right? One of the uh, robot follow classes we start seeing concepts like what was ten thousand is intolerant. Yeah, I think we all see it, and we all, most people make sense. But I, I think it's trying try to turn from anecdote, you know, and like thought, like opinions, and to, to some amount of evidence to back up what you know our practice. I think we have to approach this kind of more systematically and so that's why we've been trying to start to look at this. Do you ever consider a, a auto transplant for these patients that you can't? Um, there's one guy I attempted an auto transplant but the vein was too short so we had it all set up the transplant guys would just take over as soon as I realized I didn't have like oh um, it can be done I think um, robotically it's probably I mean look if you're going to do it I think it's just better to just do it with a big incision like the guys who so then now their their area of robotic transplantation is becoming more popular. I have not had any experience with it. So I think that in the right center at the right place, um, it's, it's doable. But I'll, I'll say that I'll, I'll say this: the 
you know, in, if you have developed a lot of these techniques, those cases should be very few and far between. Right? I mean, there is some complication profile, no matter what you do, that, that you're disconnecting a kidney and you're reconnecting a kidney. And that process, you know, um, there are some complications with that. The, the thing about buckle, and I know buckle doesn't fit all these things. Like you got a pan-urinal structure, you got something else going on. But uh, uh, the buckle graph, I look at it as like a free shot. You know, this is an outpatient procedure. We'll do it, and we'll send them home from the recovery room, right? Foreign physicians, right? And so I feel like a buckle graph in most of these cases, or even like double-level buckles, will sometimes put above and below or left and right side. You know, uh, it's like a free shot, right? If that fails, then you can go to a, a, a bigger procedure. But I feel like a patient should get a first shot where it's a lot less invasive, a lot easier to recover from, you know. Uh, and so that's the kind of where I see it. And then you get one free shot at doing a buckle graph on somebody. Dr. Yoon, this is Jamie Cavallo. I'm one of the uh, reconstructive urologists here at Yale. I really appreciated your talk. Um, I wanted to ask, you had mentioned about the pseudoaneurysm that often forms using the buccal graft in the ureter. Do you think there's any role for buttressing the graft down to the psoas to help prevent that? Um, so I, I, I think that one of those cases were done uh, that way without momentum, but, uh, and so I think uh, Lee Zhao and Mike Stifelman, when Mike was at NYU, they did one case like that, where they opened up the psoas fascia and on the actual muscle fibers, they sutured down their buccal graft and then sewed the ureter to it. And um, you know that looks like a brilliant way to do it, but they told me technically it's just a real pain in the butt, right? So, you know, because now you gotta pin down, you gotta bring your ureter, so everything in your field is falling down. And that's the only one that they've ever done. And they said, no, nah, we're gonna go to buckles from now on. So that tells, that tells me something. Question from one of our endourology fellows. Um, do you, know, do you happen to know if the digital ureteroscope would work with the Firefly, or if it has to be a fiber rock, uh, a fiber rock <coughs> ureteroscope? I've been told, see at Temple, we don't have any digital <laughs> ureteroscopes. <laughs> so we don't have that issue, but I've been told by other people that have digital scopes that that light, for whatever reason, doesn't work well or doesn't work with near infrared. Any questions? So, um, thoughts on why there's a, a, uh, a difference in structure rate between open and robotic, uh, in, in open and open and robotic cystectomy. I mean, it's the theoretically the, the same operation, technically the same, but there's you know the series all show a difference in structure rate. What do you think that's due to? Um, that's that's a great thought. You know, you're right. I mean, I I have actually wondered about this myself. I you know I just wonder if it's that. You know the amount of magnification that we have robotically is 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 very different. I think we can see little blood supply coming in. We can choose to leave those things alone. We can you know choose our microplane that we want to go to. I just wonder if it's those things. I think it's impossible to see a lot of that through you know even if you're wearing loops. That's you know um, I don't know if the bites that you're taking are maybe less precise if they're an open incision. Yeah, I think the stricture rate is higher. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, Actually, I'd like to comment on that. I think, Pat, that's old data. The newer data, actually, once you have a mature, um, the, you're over the learning curve, there's several papers that have shown that is actually not the case. Oh, you know, you're talking about your inner character structures. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a lot of thoughts on that as well. I think that um, when, you're, when you're trying to do a urinary enteric anastomosis through an open incision, right? You're trying to extend that ureter dissection as much as possible. You have that ureter under tension, right? And you're trying to sew through this tiny incision. To me, it doesn't make any sense. I feel like just open it then, right? And sew it in. Um, you know, what I've realized is that I take my ureters and um, I do all of my work intracorporeally. I cut like five, six centimeters of like ureter off, right? There's very little ureter mobilized, except for you know whatever crossover from the left side. But I cut, I trim a lot of it off because a lot of it's not necessary. And the more you cut back, the better perfused they are. And so um, in the age, I think in a, in like if you're doing everything intracorporeally, you're cutting your ureter short, you're checking your near infrared, you know, trim that back to where you need to. You know, I, I think that we're going to see definitely an improvement in this area, right? But I think in the old era where we're trying to pull everything through an open incision, through a tiny open incision, yeah, that's a complete setup for failure. Yeah. 
Dr. Yoon, have you done any uh, histology correlates between uh, like when you have a ureter and you give the ICG and you see some ischemia and cut out that ischemic part and then maybe take a trim of the well perfused part and see how that looks differently under histology? We have not. Um, I, I, at some point, we try to, to chase uh, the pathology on the near infrared um, with the pathologist, and, and they needed you know, fluorescent scopes, they needed special equipment to look at it. To them, they couldn't see any of the near infrared. But I've not looked at the actual pathology um, you know, uh, systematically on, on these stricter cases, though. No. Might be worth doing when you have extra length and seeing if there's a difference in density of blood vessels or diameter of blood vessels or. So you can see that there's some histological correlate to that visual. Yeah, effect. it's definitely doable. It's a great idea. Thank you. Else? Anyone on the call on the Zoom questions? Okay, well, thank you.